Good evening. On behalf of the faculty of the School of Journalism, I'd like to welcome you to the 23rd T. Anthony Polner Lecture. I'm Carol Van Valkenburg. The Anthony Polner Endowment has given the school and its students the gift of sharing the lives and expertise of some of the nation's most distinguished journalists. We've been blessed to have in residence several Pulitzer Prize recipients, National Magazine Award winners, and holders of numerous other journalism honors. Yet their prizes and other accomplishments tell but a bit of the story. So many of these men and women have come here and shared their stories, inspired their students, coaxed and coached them to do their best journalism, found them jobs, and left here loving them and this place. It's a legacy that honors Anthony and will forever keep his memory alive. Thank you as always to Anthony's parents, Allison, Ben, and his siblings, Edward and Amy, and their children, including Emma and Lily, who are here tonight, for turning your grief into something that has left an indelible mark on hundreds of young people. Someone reflecting on the loss of their young son wrote, I still search for him, but without desperation. I look for him in others. In many journalism students, we can and do find Anthony. In the students who are bright, fully charged, in love with life, who want to shake things up, challenge authority, and don't back down, but who are funny, fair, and full of adventure. Last week, I got to listen in as New York Times reporter Eli Saslow talked with Polner professor Linda Robinson's class. Eli has been twice awarded the Pulitzer Prize and has twice more been a Pulitzer finalist. Eli was also our youngest to date Polner professor. Sorry. In something of a full circle moment, Linda was Eli's editor on one of his first big narrative stories that set the stage for his career. There are a lot of big, bold personalities in journalism. The men and women whose names are atop the stories that win awards and admiration. But though many in the public don't realize it, all writers know that these editors be behind the scenes who don't get all the public accolades are integral to journalism. Linda Robinson is one of those. One writer said of her, Linda has great range and fearlessness as an editor. No subject is too deep or complex for her to tackle. It's not because she's an expert in every field that writers drop at her doorstep, but because she brings a certain sensibility, warm, curious, generous, and humane, yet skeptical. I trust her because I know her goal and mine are always the same, to get the best, fairest, and most compelling story possible. Today, the Polner family got to sit in on Linda's class where another Washington Post's remarkably talented reporters explained in detail how she researched, reported, and shaped stories for which Linda was her much valued editor. It was a gift to all of us in the room to hear how painstakingly she did her job and how much she valued Linda's counsel. Editors labor largely in anonymity and that's how most prefer it. But tonight we get the gift of hearing from Linda directly as she shares her thoughts on the differences between journalism and advocacy and why that matters. Please welcome the 2023 T. Anthony Polner Distinguished Professor, Linda Robinson. Uh, hi, hello everyone, and thanks to Carol for that generous introduction, but also for her warm welcome when my husband and I arrived in Missoula. She cares so deeply about UM, its journalism program, its students, and the memory of Anthony Polner, a young man with so much promise and passion for journalism, and especially for the Kaiman. I want to take a moment to pay tribute to the Polner family Anthony's mother, Alice, who is here tonight, along with his brother, Edward, his sister-in-law, Becca, and his nieces, Lily and Emma. Their creation and continued support of the Palner Professorship 
memorializes Anthony in such a remarkable way. Please join me in applauding the Palmer family. It is an incredible honor to be here this semester to join the long roster of distinguished journalists who have come to this beautiful campus to teach and to advise the students following in Anthony's footsteps at the Kaiman. It would be hard for me to overstate how much I love these young journalists, their energy and enthusiasm, their dedication to learning the craft their willingness to put in long hours at the Kaiman while juggling their classes and part-time jobs. Yesterday, the pumpkin appeared on the top of the spire of University Hall, and a bear was wandering around the Curry Health Center, and the Kaiman students sprang into action, and <laughs> they had... Uh, Christine Compton had a, a story online about, about the pumpkin, and we had an Instagram about the bear. It was amazing. <laughs> I have been so wowed by them again and again. So here's a shout out to the talented editors of the Kaiman. Emily, Claire, Christine, Chris, Max, Haley, Chloe, the McKennas, better known as Kenny G and Kenny J, Alyssa, Clayton, Griffin, Caden, and all the reporters working for them. Anthony would be as proud of you as I am. My start in journalism was pretty similar to yours, the Daily Collegian at Penn State University. I'd never written a story before I started working there when I was 19 years old. I wasn't a journalism major, sorry Lee, <laughs> I was a history and political science major, so I was utterly clueless about being a reporter and totally naive, too. Here's how I decided to become a journalist. In seventh grade, my English teacher asked our class to say what each of us wanted to be when we grew up. I'd literally never thought about it before. I'm dating myself here, but I don't think my parents had any expectations for me beyond getting married and having kids. There was nothing unusual about that. Back then, feminism was a fledgling movement, and working mothers in the suburbs of Philadelphia where I grew up and where I was raised were rare. At the age of 12, I was startled by the question of a career, and I needed to come up with something to say by the time it was my turn to declare an ambition. I loved reading, and specifically, I loved reading Time Magazine, which a family I babysat for subscribed to. I also loved writing term papers for my English and history classes. So when my teacher got to me, here's what I said. I want to be a writer for Time Magazine. I never deviated from that goal, probably out of sheer stubbornness. When I got to Penn State, I was still telling people I wanted to be a writer for Time Magazine. Spoiler alert, I never got hired at Time Magazine. <laughs> at the Daily Collegian, an editor named Phil Guttis, who was a junior and went on to work for the New York Times, explained the basics of writing a news story to me. The inverted pyramid and writing leads that focused on the who, what, where, when, and why the warning to carefully check how people spell their names and titles, the urgency of never missing a deadline. Holy shit, it sounded hard. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing, but I started doing it anyway. And pretty soon, I was working at the Collegian 40 hours a week. Like the kick-ass Kaiman students I'm advising now alongside our North Star, Jewel Banville, I was shaped by my time at the Collegian and also by my time at Penn State. I loved the campus, my professors, my classes, my study abroad, and most of all, the close friends I made, a group of whom just came to Missoula to visit me. They were dazzled by the tour of UM. I showed them the Oval and the Kaiman Newsroom, 
and the gorgeous space where I am teaching my seminar this semester. It triggered lots of stories uh, about our time at Penn State. My affection for that place runs just as deep as yours does for UM. So imagine my outrage and my sense of betrayal when I learned that my alma mater had done something heinous, something that disgusted me. It was 2011, and I was working as a social issues editor at the Washington Post. This meant I led our coverage of immigration, poverty, homelessness, religion, lots of other key topics. It was a demanding job, one that required a thoughtful, nuanced approach to stories, not hot takes. In Harrisburg, a young reporter at the Patriot News named Sarah Gannon had begun reporting on what would be an explosive story and win her the Pulitzer Prize in 2012. She'd learned that a former football coach at Penn State, Jerry Sandusky, the team's retired defensive coordinator, had been sexually abusing young boys for years, probably for decades. He did this not just in the basement of his home near State College, Pennsylvania, but in the football team's locker room at Penn State. That is where a former player and graduate assistant witnessed him raping a child in the showers. The university knew about this and about other allegations of abuse and had been covering it up for a long time. Penn State's legendary football coach, Joe Paterno, knew about it and had done nothing to stop it. Football is practically a religion at Penn State, and Joe Paterno held a godlike status on campus, both for his success on the field, but also for his refusal to cut corners in the cutthroat world of big time college football. His players actually graduated because he cared about academics. He'd studied literature at Brown University. He and his wife, Sue, had donated millions of dollars to the university's library. When I was at Penn State, there was talk he might run for governor of Pennsylvania. Believe me, he would have won. Everyone admired the guy. Players, alumni, and students who called him Joe Pa and had life-sized cardboard cutouts of him in their dorm rooms and their apartments. I'm sure I posed beside one at some point. Now, I was suddenly presented with a very different version of Joe Paterno. He and the rest of the powerful men who ran Penn State, and they were all men, were a lot more worried about protecting the school's reputation and its vaunted football program than they were about protecting the children being raped by Jerry Sandusky. Well, I pretty much lost my mind. And I did something that for a journalist was very ill-advised. I began railing about the scandal and Penn State's cover-up on Facebook, where lots of my pals were debating what should be done. Many of them felt conflicted because Paterno had done so much good at Penn State. I was not conflicted. I wanted everyone fired, including Joe Pa, and said so repeatedly. Then, a few days into this public display of opinion, one of my favorite colleagues at the Post, Chris Davenport, appeared at my desk. He'd seen my rants and confronted me about them. What in the world are you doing, he demanded. He didn't think I should be using social media that way, that my posts were totally inappropriate. We argued about it. I was entirely dismissive of his concern that I was lapsing from being a journalist into being an activist. I explained to him that I was a Penn State alumni and felt entitled to express my anger about what was happening there. I noted that I didn't edit stories about higher education, so I wasn't worried about any conflict. He walked away shaking his head. A few days after this conversation, another colleague appeared at my desk national reporter Joel Achenbach. Hey, he said, we are putting together a team to write a big story about the Sandusky scandal at Penn State. 
and we think you'd be the ideal person to edit it. I'm not making this up. I couldn't believe it. Even though I already knew that I disqualified myself, I went to the newsroom's ethics guru, Peter Pearl, and told him that I'd been asked to edit this story, but that I'd been very outspoken about the Sandusky situation on Facebook. I guess that means I can't edit this piece Joel is going to anchor, I said. Yep, that's what it means, he replied. No way can you edit that story. I was so upset that I put myself in this position, but it couldn't be undone, not even if I deleted the Facebook posts. Here's the thing. My identity as a Penn State graduate didn't preclude me from editing the piece. In fact, it made me better qualified and was part of the reason that I'd been approached to handle the story. I knew the campus. I knew the culture. I knew the politics. What precluded me from editing the story <laughs> was my public activism on a social media platform. I had taken a side and advocated for an outcome. And this was why my friend Chris Davenport had sounded the alarm as soon as he saw my posts. My need to vent had cost me a professional opportunity. And these days, it might have led to disciplinary action by the post. Here's part of what our social media policy says. Post journalists should ensure that their activity on social media platforms would not make reasonable people question their editorial independence, nor make reasonable people question the post's ability to cover issues fairly. Our newsroom's diversity strengthens our journalism, and post journalists can bring their backgrounds, identity, and experiences to their social media accounts. It is not appropriate to use your social media account to advocate for causes, issues, governmental policies, or political or judicial outcomes. Before you publish a post on social media, ask yourself if it compromises our newsroom's mission to prioritize fact-finding. Ask yourself if it would be harmful for your message to be associated with the post. Ask yourself if the words or images you are using will undermine the post's journalistic reputation for reporting the news fairly, accurately, and without bias. If the answer to any of these is yes, don't post. This guidance didn't exist uh, yet when I went off the rails more than a decade ago, but I certainly learned the hard way that I should always be a journalist and never an activist. And this is what I want to talk to you about tonight, the difference between journalism and activism, especially now in a country that's so politically and culturally polarized. When I told Lee Banville, the director of UM School of Journalism, that I was thinking about speaking on this topic, he urged me to do it. Not only because it is a subject of debate in many newsrooms across the country, including at the Post, but because students and professors at UM are grappling with this issue too. Some of you may disagree, perhaps vehemently, with what I am going to say. That's okay. I like the idea of kicking up some controversy, and we will have time for questions and comments at the end, so please don't hesitate to take the microphone and make the counter argument. I promise not to lose my mind. Let me start out by acknowledging that activists play a crucial role in American society and always have, from abolitionists and suffragists to labor leaders and environmentalists. People pushing for change have made this country a better, fairer place to live. Some of you may choose activism instead of journalism, and that's a tremendously valuable path to pursue. There are also branches of journalism where having strong views is not just acceptable, but mandatory. If you want to be a movie critic or a TV critic or a restaurant critic, your opinion is crucial. If you are a sports columnist or metro columnist, your opinion is the whole point. The Post and lots of other news organizations write editorials that call for change. We make political endorsements in local and national races, 
and we pay legions of opinion writers to sound off on everything from the war in Ukraine to the Trump indictments. I can't tell you how much I admire the work that critics and opinion writers do. At their best, they help us make sense of the world around us, challenge our old ideas with new ones, and sometimes even get us to change our minds. Even better, critics and opinion writers are entitled to go on social media platforms and say whatever they want, whenever they want. That's, in fact, part of their jobs. But I was not a critic or an opinion writer when I started blasting Penn State on Facebook. I was an editor at a major newspaper that was trying to surround a story and cover it with as much depth as possible. My opinion didn't matter. The facts were what mattered. We needed to help uncover them and let readers decide what should happen next. The Post once had a renowned executive editor, Len Downey, who refused to vote because he didn't want the newspaper's political coverage to be tainted in any way by his political preferences. Was that really necessary? How far do journalists have to go in pursuit of neutrality or the appearance of neutrality? Is that even possible or desirable? There are plenty of people who contend that neutrality and objectivity are an illusion, or at least overdue for serious re-examination. One of them is Wes Lowry, a former colleague and a much admired black reporter who won a Pulitzer for his deep reporting on police brutality and the creation of a Washington Post database that tracks fatal police shootings in America. He left the Post because of repeated clashes with editors over tweets that called out racism in unapologetic ways. Should go without saying, he tweeted a few years ago, reporters of color shouldn't have their jobs threatened for speaking out about mainstream media failures to properly cover and contextualize issues of race. What's the point of bringing diverse experience and voices into a room only to muzzle them? Good question. Wes also argued that, quote, objectivity obsessed both sides journalism is a failed experiment. We need to rebuild our industry as one that operates from a place of moral clarity. In an opinion piece in the New York Times, he urged reporters, quote, to focus on being fair and telling the truth as best one can, based on the given context and available facts. Great advice. But does expressing opinions on social media help journalists in their quest to be fair and tell the truth? Or does it hinder them? Another much admired black journalist, Dean Bacay, who retired last year as the executive editor of the New York Times, agrees that the word objectivity is deeply problematic and that the goal of great journalism should be the independent pursuit of truth. Independence, he told the New Yorker magazine before his retirement, means being independent of everybody and of ideology. It just does. The case worries about social media go beyond its siren call to journalists to express opinions instead of do their work. My job, he said, is to try to convince my newsroom that they should not be overly influenced by criticism from Twitter, and that they shouldn't be afraid of taking on subjects that are edgy and complicated, that they should report those subjects independently and fairly. And if Twitter doesn't like it, Twitter can jump in the lake. I love that quote. I have been in meetings where journalists hesitate to take on certain stories about immigration, abortion, policing, transgender athletes for fear of being attacked by activists on social media. I will never forget how furious immigration rights activists were when we began scrutinizing a sharp rise in MS-13 gang killings in the Washington region in 2017. The sudden resurgence of MS-13 
had been fueled by a flood of unaccompanied minors crossing the border and then being sent to live with relatives already in the U.S. These were teens fleeing horrifying gang violence in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, only to fall prey to the same violent gangs in Northern Virginia and Maryland. At the time, Donald Trump and others were demonizing immigrants, and they were seizing on our pieces about MS-13 to push their political agenda. Immigration rights activists hated our MS-13 stories, especially our examination of the connection between MS-13 violence and unaccompanied minors. For one of my reporters, a fluent Spanish speaker who had written movingly about the plight of the undocumented, it was awful to be accused of being anti-immigrant on Twitter by activists. But we also couldn't ignore the escalating violence around us, which kept ending with 15 and 16-year-old kids from Central America being stabbed and dismembered. Sometimes it was because those kids were resisting the gangs. Often their gruesome murders were videoed and sent to gang leaders in El Salvador. In MS-13, brutal violence is how you prove yourself and move up the hierarchy. As we published these stories that were generating so much outrage on social media, we kept reminding ourselves, we don't have a political agenda. We are journalists, and this is an important story that demands attention. Children are being murdered. Our reporting won a National Press Foundation Award and led to the revival of a regional task force aimed at dismantling MS-13. The following year, the gang murders started dropping. I can't prove it, but I think our unflinching coverage of MS-13 saved lives. Unflinching is a word I use a lot when I talk about stories with my reporters who specialize in scene-based narratives and narrative accountability stories. The goal of these pieces is to take readers deep inside other people's lives with empathy, but also with an unwavering commitment to facts. Have any of you watched the classic TV show, Friday Night Lights? It's so great. <laughs> Coach Taylor makes his young high school football players repeat this mantra, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. It's a great mantra for journalists as well. One of my reporters, Jessica Contrera, who spoke to my seminar class today, has written stories about child sex trafficking so complex and thought-provoking that last year she won the Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics from the Center for Journalism Ethics at the University of Wisconsin. She spent months delving into the case of Crystal Kaiser, who was charged with killing her trafficker when she was 17 years old. Jessica did not try to minimize the evidence against Crystal, who admitted to the police that she shot her trafficker and set his body on fire in Kenosha, Wisconsin in 2018. Jessica's story was forthright about every aspect of the murder, including texts and Facebook posts that suggested premeditation. But Jessica also discovered that Kenosha police and prosecutors had known for months that Crystal's trafficker was sexually abusing girls who appeared as young as 12 years old and filming what he was doing to them. The police had even arrested him after another girl fled his house. But the very same day they arrested him, they let him go. If they'd kept him in custody, he'd still be alive, and the teenager who killed him wouldn't have been in jail awaiting trial. By drawing national attention to the systemic failures in Crystal's case, Jessica's inv investigation eventually helped get Crystal released on $400,000 bail. The story also fueled debate in Wisconsin and across the country about whether sex trafficking victims should be punished for crimes they commit as a result of being abused. This is what impact looks like, and it is way more satisfying than tweeting a free crystal hashtag. 
Another one of my writers, John Woodrow Cox, has devoted six years of his life to telling one story, what gun violence is doing to America's children. He has written one devastating piece after another about the school shootings, mass shootings, drive-by shootings, family shootings, accidental shootings, and suicides that have transformed gun violence into the leading cause of death for kids in this country. Bullets now kill more children in the United States than car accidents. John's stories, which are almost always told from the perspective of kids instead of the adults around them, have won so many awards I can't even list them all here. He has written an acclaimed book, Children Under Fire, An American Crisis, which I urge you to read. John gets attacked on social media all the time by gun rights advocates who accuse him of being a gun grabber. What they don't know is that John is a gun owner himself. He's not a gun control activist. He doesn't seek removal of the Second Amendment from the U.S. Constitution. He's a journalist covering one of the most important issues of our time. For John, this meant telling the story of four-year-old Mayanna Hinton, who was accidentally shot by a seven-year-old relative with a loaded gun left in a dresser drawer. Mayanna is six now, and she will never walk again. It meant telling the story of Tyler Paxton, who just turned 11 years old when he told his parents he was going to watch cartoons in their bedroom. Instead, he opened his dad's gun safe with the key his dad left on top, took out a loaded 357 Magnum, and killed himself. He was their only child. It meant telling the story of 10-year-old Caitlin Gonzalez, who lost many of her closest friends at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Somehow, in between her cemetery visits and her nightmares, Caitlin emerged as the public voice for her slain classmates. John and another Post colleague, Stephen Rich, have created the most important school shooting database in the country. It doesn't just track the number of people killed or injured in school shootings. It tracks the number of children exposed to gun violence and traumatized by it at school. Here's what we know because of their painstaking work. More than 356,000 children in the United States have lived through gun violence at their elementary, middle, and high schools since the Columbine Massacre in 1999. This is what makes journalism so powerful and why it is a crucial pillar of our democracy. Some of you might be familiar with the Post slogan, democracy dies in darkness. I cringed when we first adopted it. It sounded like a bad Batman movie. But its message has grown on me over time because it's true. Many of the students here tonight have chosen journalism as a profession because they want to make a difference. The best way to do that isn't by making pronouncements on TikTok or sharing political slogans on Instagram. It is by scrutinizing how people are being failed by powerful institutions. I'll give you a couple of examples from my team. In 2020, Ian Shapiro, who first came to the post as a 21-year-old intern and is now a 45-year-old enterprise reporter, embarked on a series of stories about racism and misogyny at Virginia Military Institute, the nation's oldest state-supported military college. You may not have heard of VMI because it's much smaller than West Point or the Naval Academy. So let me tell you a bit about it. Its cadets fought and died to defend slavery during the Civil War. And one of its professors, Stonewall Jackson, became one of the Confederacy's most celebrated generals. Perhaps not surprisingly, VMI was the last public college in Virginia to integrate in 1968. It took a decision by the US Supreme Court to force VMI to open its doors to women in 1997 not that long ago, despite the fact 
that it is a state-funded college. After writing about the college's refusal to take down a prominent statue of Stonewall Jackson on its campus, Ian started reaching out to black cadets and alumni about their experiences at VMI. Most of them were reluctant to talk about the racism they'd endured there, fearing harassment from their white classmates. But Ian slowly gathered jaw-dropping accounts about a lynching threat made to a freshman, a business professor reminiscing about her father's Ku Klux Klan membership in the middle of class, and constant pressure on students of color to celebrate the school's Confederate history. Here's what happened as a result of the first story and the others that followed. Virginia's governor, a VMI graduate himself, ordered an independent investigation into racism at the school. The longtime superintendent of the school resigned, and he was replaced by the first black leader in VMI's 181-year-old history. The college's board of visitors voted to remove the statue of Stonewall Jackson from the campus. The backlash to our coverage was intense. Ian was attacked on social media by students and threatened by alumni. At one point, the threats were so serious that the Post sent a security guard to his house. It never slowed his reporting, which continued to unfold over the course of two years. He dove deep into VMI's student-run justice system, revealing how it expels black cadets at a disproportionate rate. He persuaded female cadets and graduates to recount the sexual assaults and misogyny they'd been subjected to for years. He even exposed the use of waterboarding at VMI as a hazing technique. Ian's work has had profound impact on a school that furiously resisted change. It won many awards, including the George Polk, which honors the country's most original investigative reporting, the Paul Tobenkin, which recognizes outstanding reporting on hatred or discrimination in the United States, and the Fred M. Heckinger, the nation's top award for education writing. Many Post readers were outraged by what I and found at VMI, and some questioned why Virginia was funding this school. Our editorial board repeatedly called for reform, but Ian didn't. He delivered revelatory reporting that was fact-based, fair, and completely unflinching, and let state lawmakers, Virginia residents, VMI alumni, donors, and students debate what should happen next. William Wan took the same approach when he began reporting on Yale's mental health policies, which had come under attack after the suicide of a freshman named Rachel Shaw Rosenbaum in 2021. She'd been too afraid to seek help for her worsening depression because Yale often forced depressed or suicidal students to withdraw from the university. Then they had to reapply to get back in. We decided to tell this story through the experiences of a young woman who'd been forced to leave Yale after a suicide attempt. William followed her for several months through the fraught reapplication process. He also talked to two dozen current and former students about the way Yale had treated them when they were in crisis. Some described never hearing back from Yale counselors after seeking help. Others said they hid mental problems and suicidal thoughts to avoid triggering withdrawal policies that they believed were designed to protect Yale from lawsuits and damage to its reputation. The response to this story was immense. Yale's president sent a letter to thousands of riled up alumni disputing the reporting, but also promising a new counseling center and more mental health services. A U.S. Senator asked the Justice Department to investigate and asked the Education Department to warn all U.S. colleges and universities against using leaves of absence to discriminate against students with mental health problems. Yale students cited the story when they filed a class action lawsuit alleging that the university was discriminating against suicidal 
and mentally ill students. Last month, Yale settled the lawsuit and made sweeping changes to its mental health policies. It will no longer force students in crisis to withdraw and will make it much simpler for them to return to Yale if they do decide to take time off. Yale also agreed to let students take a reduced class schedule instead of having to leave campus, something it had resisted for a long time. Williams' investigation and the attention it received played an important role in Yale's decision to stop exiling students who are suffering. This is what real journalism can do, expose problems that lead to change. But that is not the only way to have impact as a journalist. There is tremendous value in taking readers, viewers, or listeners inside the lives of people they might not meet otherwise or inside worlds they might not encounter otherwise. This is especially important at a time when Americans have divided themselves into camps, walling themselves off from people who don't think like them or live like them. Journalism, especially narrative journalism, can bridge that divide and help us understand one another. Instead of jeering on Twitter at a COVID denier who died of the virus, what if we took the time to understand the forces that shaped him and cost him his life? Instead of condemning a homeless mother whose eight-year-old daughter went missing because of her negligence, what if we examined that woman's own childhood and learned what made her struggle to be a parent? I've assigned so many stories about people whose lives are hard to fathom. Some of them are heroes. A DC carpet cleaner who can speak more than 40 languages. My students heard all about that today. The sole survivor of a deadly lightning strike outside the White House. A man who spent 16 months in solitary confinement for defending himself during a robbery. Some of them are the opposite of heroes the well-off couple who decided to sell America's nuclear weapon secrets to the highest bidder, the University of Virginia graduate turned white supremacist who organized the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, a gun-wielding warehouse worker who drove from Salisbury, North Carolina to Washington, D.C. to rescue children he believed were imprisoned in the basement of a pizzeria and being abused by powerful Democrats. The place didn't even have a basement. On January 6, 2021, as a mob stormed the US Capitol, one of my reporters, Peter Jamison, stood outside, risking his safety in the middle of the chaos and watching in horror as medics rushed Ashley Babbitt to an ambulance. She'd been shot trying to overturn the 2020 election. She died a short time later. Peter knew right away that we needed to understand what brought this 35-year-old woman from California to Washington that day. We assembled a team to chronicle her life and death as quickly as possible. One of the things we learned was that before she'd embraced QAnon's unhinged conspiracy theories, she'd served in the military for a decade. Six of those years were spent in a DC Air National Guard unit that is dedicated to defending Washington during civil unrest. Its nickname, the Capitol Guardians. How astonishing is that? We tell these stories to hold a mirror up to our country, revealing our flaws and fault lines, our pathologies and our contradictions. No one does this better than Eli Saslow, a two-time Pulitzer winner and a former Polner professor I have known and admired since he was 24 years old. He spoke to my class last week and what he told them was so important. Eli is a master at the, at the art of writing about people who are struggling with big problems, eviction, unemployment, drug addiction, homelessness. Earlier this year, he wrote an unforgettable story for the New York Times about a couple who own a sandwich shop next to a vast homeless encampment in Phoenix, Arizona. The homeless encampment was destroying this couple's business, which they'd worked for decades 
to build and nurture. Eli spent time with them, exploring what this was doing to their lives and their livelihood. But he also spent time in the homeless encampment, offering readers an equally rich portrait of its desperate and often drug-addicted or mentally ill inhabitants. After the story published, Eli gave an interview about what he tries to achieve when he reports and writes. Quote, I'm never rooting for an outcome or arriving in someone's life as an advocate. I'm there as an observer, he explained. But it's also not true to say that I don't care. If I don't care about the people I'm meeting or the things that I'm seeing, how can I ever hope to write a story that's going to make other people care? I have to care and feel invested, not in a way that I'm favoring one person over another or rooting for a certain outcome, but I have to tap into my own empathy and humanity. This is what America and American journalism need right now a deep empathy for the human condition, a dedication to facts instead of ideology, and a desire to reveal the world rather than spout slogans about it. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Thank you for listening. Linda's going to take some questions, um, right. and so we were, yeah. I forgot about that part. I did promise to do that. Yes, you did, and uh, so we're recording this, so if you do have a question, there are mics. Go to the mic so we can hear your question, and um, that way, Lee is going to bring the mic to you. So um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have questions, and we'll take some, and then I'll tell you when we can't take any more. There we go. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll get there in a second. Let's start right here. You, you've talked about. Uh, you've contrasted, say, the Washington Post and and the social media, uh, Facebook or something. Uh, would Would you say that there's sort of between those two poles, there's a there's a continuum of what's a little bit more journalistic from social media. I mean, and you've also you've also identified truth as being the goal of, of mm -hmm. journalism, and yet on this, as I see it, on this continuum from journalism to social media, where anything goes, there's kind of a continuum of veracity too. I mean, I I wonder if you want to talk could talk about some of the intermediate stages between those two? Well, social media is a really useful reporting tool. Um, uh, we find out all kinds of things from social media. Um, we get story ideas from social media. So I don't want to sound like I hate social media. We get ideas from TikTok and Instagram and Twitter all the time. <coughs> um, but they have to be reported out, and we never take anything um, that's been posted on social media at face value. But, I mean, uh, you can find out a lot about Ukraine from following certain Telegram accounts. Um, you can find out a lot about Washington, D.C. by following certain D.C.-focused accounts. Um, so it's a very useful reporting tool, but it's not the, um, it's not something that you can solely rely on at all. Hi, my question for you was, um, what advice would you give to a reporter or advice for yourself when you're reporting on a topic that you might be very passionate about? And how, what, would you, what advice would you give to someone to stay objective? in reporting an issue. Thank right. You. Well, um, you have to decide. There are a lot of decisions that um, reporters have to make um, in terms of how they're going to tell a story. Um, and, you know, uh, I think if you 
are only trying to tell it from one point of view, um, that that is dangerous. But tapping into your own what are you passionate about and using that to find stories is a, a great thing. But you still have to be open to the idea that um, <laughs> there is more than one point of view on many, many issues, um, whether that's abortion or immigration or uh, the 2024 presidential election. <laughs> there, there is not only one way to see these things. So it's really important that um, you can uh, – that you can talk to people who make you uncomfortable, that you can talk to people who are not like you. Um, and in fact, later in this semester, one of the things that uh, I want my students in my seminar class to do is um, find someone to write about who makes them uncomfortable. Um, that is a true test of, of a journalist, I think. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, you talked about your your feelings about Penn State, and yeah. that you'd said them. But what if you hadn't have said them, and you did get approached to edit that series, but you did feel that way about it? Mm, that's How a good do you balance? Because I think that's where a lot of people are like, well, but you journalists have opinions. And clearly, they're going to show up, even if they don't say them out loud. They're still there. And therefore, I guess, how would you have navigated that? So I think it would have been fine for me to be angry about what had gone down there. I think the problem was that I had already reached a conclusion and advocated for an outcome. Fire them all. I mean, I had literally said this on Facebook. <laughs> and, and that is completely inappropriate. You also have to check your own biases. Um, there was a, a, a pretty famous case of um, Duke lacrosse players being accused of um, uh, raping a, a woman uh, at a party. And when I found out that these Duke lacrosse players went to certain private schools in Washington, D.C. I immediately thought, oh, yeah, they did it. The, the, that, the, they did it. They didn't do it. <laughs> it was a hoax. And so <laughs> to answer the question about passion, if you feel passionately about sexual assault, you might jump to conclusions about an individual sexual assault. The, the other really more recent case that's even more famous is the Rolling Stone case, um, in which uh, a pe people assumed that her story was true. And it was not thoroughly checked by the reporter at the Rolling Stone. And she had made it up. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, uh, most sexual assault victims are making their stories up. But when you are reporting about a sexual assault case, don't assume you know <laughs> what happened. Um, it's dangerous to think that, uh, that, you, that you know. But I still think they all should have been fired. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, Linda. Hi. <laughs> um, my question is, when dealing with backlash on controversial stories, how do you separate criticisms of your writing from yourself? Um, yeah, I think it's hard um, to be attacked. Um, and the younger you are, the harder it is. And the older you are, the more you don't give a shit. <laughs> And that's just, that's just the reality of it. it. If you are subjected to a lot of abuse on social media, it is important to ask yourself, was I fair? Was I unbiased? Was I unflinching in approaching this subject? 
If the answers to that are yes, and you're still being attacked, as Dean Baquet said, you know, Twitter can go jump in a lake. Um, he's right about that. You, you cannot report from a position of fear. That is, uh, you, 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 look, if you take on certain subjects, you are going to be attacked. You know it. You have to accept that. If you're the kind of person who can't bear to be attacked, publicly attacked, journalism is not the right, <laughs> journalism is not the right field for you. You have to have a, a thick skin. But you also have to be responsive to genuine um, criticism. And um, journalists get things wrong all the time. I got the Penn State thing wrong, dramatically wrong. And so, you know, we're going to make mistakes, and we have to own up to them. We have to own our mistakes. Um, but we also have to own, <laughs> we also cannot be writing to make activists happy. That is a recipe for disaster. Um, and I really have encountered a lot of people who are like, if I write that story, I am going to be attacked. But that's part of the job, honestly. Hi, Linda. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Emily. What How up? Are you? <laughs> um, so I know the 2023 legislative session in Montana was hard for a lot of student journalists here um, that I worked with and just my friends. Um, right. Just because a lot of what went on had to do with people's identities. Um, Mm -hmm. And reporting on those things when, like, maybe your identity was one that was maybe being attacked by the legislature was hard for people. So we were kind of talking, ab you were talking about, like, the sort of both sidedism of objectivity and journalism. And you right. didn't necessarily take a stance on that. But I'm curious how that applies when, like, say, a queer person is reporting on, like, queer issues or, like, someone that is a racial minority is reporting on like race-based race violence, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, um, I think my point of view on this is that your identity um, can make you way better qualified to be the one to report on it. But that doesn't mean that um, if you are reporting on what's going on in the Montana legislature, you don't talk to the people that make you uncomfortable. You have to talk to the people who make you uncomfortable. That's, um, you, it, there is sometimes a desire to simply avoid that, and it's not possible to do that. And, you know, we run into that a lot um, when we're writing about white supremacists, for instance. Um, I am a reporter who uh, wrote about BMI. He did a whole bunch of stuff after Charlottesville, after the Unite the Right rally. Um, he, he profiled Jason Kessler, who was the organizer. He, he, pro he profiled this really interesting attorney who was representing all the white supremacists in court. Um, and those stories were really interesting and revealing and important stories to do. So we don't just say, oh, we're not gonna write about Richard Spencer. We write about Richard Spencer because people need to know who he is and what he's about and what he's doing. So, you know, um, uh, concluding that right, not writing about Hitler is somehow going to stop his rise in Germany, that is not the right approach to take, I don't think. Did that answer your question? We have time for one or two more. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Emily's question. If you're trying to talk to both sides or all 55 sides, <laughs> what do you do if someone simply will not talk to you? Do you just have to put that story aside or do you just keep digging or do you give up? Um, well, it really depends on the story and, um, and what kind of story it is. 
um, the fact that Yale wasn't going to talk to us about um, it's, it, they refused to talk to us about forcing suicidal students to withdraw. But that didn't mean that we weren't going to do the story. It just meant that we said in the story that they refused to talk to us about that. Um, so I don't think we abandon stories because a particular institution simply says, well, we're not going to talk to you. I mean, um, there are all kinds of ways to report around that. I'm walking over with my Yeah. <laughs> the last one. Well, I have 30 questions, but I'm going to ask just one. Um, given that you have a room of budding journalists, what stories would you like to see them tell, and how can they change the tide of the current course of reporting and faux news uh, to make it all better so we, have, we can hmm. have more trust in our news reporting? Hmm. Um, well, I feel like the students at the Kaiman um, work really hard to um, reach uh, the people that they need to talk to for stories. Not always are they um, reaching those folks because they don't want to be quoted in certain stories. Sometimes they are offering guidance on background. Sometimes they're telling them stuff off the record, and then they have to figure out a path, whoop, a path to, to um, uh, get information on the record, which is a really hard process. Um, you know, there are tons of stories here, of course. Um, every, every campus is filled with interesting people, with difficult, with crime, with difficult issues, with bears. I'm really obsessed with bears, okay? So, so, and I'm in favor of a major investigation on the bear front. They know that. Well, please join me in welcoming or in thanking uh, Linda Robinson. And if anyone could help guide her back to her car so that she doesn't run into one of the bears, that would be great. But no, thank you again. Thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. <laughs>